always so abrupt how that ends, but welcome, welcome, welcome wi fis to yet another underground transmission of the wireless woman. If you have not already, make sure you subscribe. Because how else will you know when I go live if you are not subscribed? And as you're handing in, make sure you like the, the content because I already know. I already know before we even get started, you're going to love this. Okay, make sure you drop your name, where you're from, because I anticipate seeing some folks I've never seen before. Welcome. This is room 303. It's still under renovation, but you know. We are all, like this room, a work in progress. I am so excited to share with you all today a very special guest who is new to room 303, but dear, <laughs> dear to my heart as a fellow revolu revolutionary, and that is going to be Senor Bro Diallo. We welcome him. We welcome him into the fold. Uh, as we are all trying to find our way out of this matrix-like system in America, America, yeah, America, ka, ka, as Diallo would say, it is nice to have someone else who makes me feel a little less cognitively dissonant. Someone else, um, I put it on my Facebook today, it said, in an insane world, the same people get called crazy. So it's beautiful <laughs> to have someone around to listen to that makes me feel a little bit seen, a little bit less insane. And that would be Mr. Bro Diallo himself. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Bro Diallo before he comes in here to introduce himself. Uh, because I know a lot of people who maybe follow my content have not heard of Diallo, just like people who follow him probably have never heard of me, and that makes sense. <laughs> but Diallo Kenyatta is a Pan-Africanist. He's based in Chicago, originally from Kansas City, Missouri. Yes, yes. And he's been active in the Black Empowerment and Liberation Movement for decades, long before I came around. So if you will, welcome in my very special guest. Bro, Diallo, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Very happy to be here. It is beautiful to have you, sir. Everyone in my camp knows how excited I am about this. First of all, it, took, it took a lot for me to even ask you to come. I got to be honest. Really? <laughs> That's surprising to hear. Yeah, I fan out. I fan out over Diallo a little bit because um, I'm one of those people who grew up on, you know, the Malcolm X speeches and the the Fred Hampton speeches, and I haven't heard anyone speak like you. Oh, oh, thank you. Now you didn't set the bar too high. Gosh. <laughs> Yeah, not in not in my lifetime. <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit younger than you, like this much. Right. Right. And so by the time I, I uh, came along, crackhead completely infiltrated the, the hood yeah. and uh, yeah. everybody had a herringbone chain. So, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I would have had one if I could afford it. It wasn't because of righteousness. <laughs> I just didn't have the money. <laughs> yeah, we would have had to have capitalized and exploited on our community right. to have this yeah. type of money back then. So. Yeah. so I was just telling the people about you. You're based out of Chicago, but originally from Kansas City, Missouri. I found that shocking. Yeah, killer city, state of misery. Yep, mm. East Hills Village, Southside KC. Yep, that's my hood. I'll be back there, I think in, in June, in a few weeks. Nice. I'll be in Kansas City riding. The, they brought back the trolley trains so I can, you know, get a scenic view of the racism and impression as I ride the trolley. <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be very, very fun. Well, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. It's an electric word, life. It means forever, and that's a mighty long time. Um, but we don't have a long time. We're going to talk right. about misogynoir in what I like to call post-racial America. I don't, I don't see how. Uh, I don't I, see how. I, I think that term kind of went out of... Uh, favor post-racial um in um after the obama uh first half of the first term of the obama administration you know when mm. obama kind of 
showed us his uh, true colors, literally and figuratively. And uh, I think that term kind of, since then, it's been since like 2010, I haven't really heard that, that concept being pushed hard. Well, it's a uh, in in Cindy Lauper true fashion. We have seen the true colors of many, I would say, at this point. Right. But as much as I would love to say that um, I summoned you to yeah. this podcast, you actually summoned me. Uh, you know, we are very aligned on a lot of things. You are a Pan Africanist, however, I am a Black nationalist. And uh, people who are in my generation don't understand the difference between those two things. But I feel that, you know, most most of our things we're aligned on. We're we're going to boycott the NFL and the NBA, all uh, all of that. We are also fundamentally big on uh, the cult of personality politics in the black community and what that's, you know, not doing for us. Demagoguery. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> but you summoned me when you did your show on confronting misogyny. And and it was almost like you called my name. And so I said, well, really? you know what? <laughs> you know what? Now it's time. Now it's time for me and Diallo to talk. I'm gonna show the good people a a a bit from your uh, from your show. So this is okay. Diallo on Diallo. Let's see. No, oh, where is it? Where is it, Diallo? It's not here. And now I'm sad. Okay, let me go find it outside of this. Um, outside of this. I don't know. Where is it? Why is it not playing? You know the fun that we have here when it comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's everything. And it's actually saying it's showing on screen right now, but it's not. I don't so. see it on my my side. Yeah, you know, it is the, um, they don't like me here today. They don't. Give me one more minute, and then if I can't find it, I'm just going to quote Diallo to Diallo like it's a Bible right. verse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense to me? I hear it. Yeah, that's wild, isn't it? So let me go out and go back in, see if I can find the video again. Um, opener. Show it. No, it's not there. But I say from massage noir, which is very real, and it is killing black women, it is maiming black women, it is harming black children, and it's harming the black community. Yeah. Yeah, you called my name on that one, Diallo. You said... Misogynoir. I think for the people to have a reference for how we all arrived here, you got to give them a definition, a working definition. Diallo on misogynoir. What is it? Oh well, misogynoir is simply um, a a fusion of the the the. I, I don't know. It's it's a cornerstone. Misogyny and and sexism is a cornerstone of the culture we were all born into. So it is a fusion, basically a, a marriage, an incestuous marriage between racism and, and sexism or, or the institutional practices, uh, combined institutional practices of patriarchy and racism, white mm-hmm. hegemony and capitalism. So I call it, to, to simplify, compounding oppression when a person um, is the embodiment of the intersections of several compounding oppression. So it is, it is nothing more than the bastard offspring of patriarchy and racism. And you arrive at massage noir. And the the one thing that we have to, to highlight about massage noir, unlike racism, where only white people can practice and engage in racism, massage noir is available for all people um, throughout the, 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 the hierarchy. So black mm. men, black women, and are also able to fully engage and practice massage noir, whereas racism and the institutional hierarchies that that um, create and sustain racism are unique to uh, white people or, or 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 people who identify as white within or are allowed to be identified as white within the racial and economic political hierarchy. Amazing. I don't know if that was simple, but it's a it's a it's a, a 
incestuous marriage between <laughs> patriarchy and racism. You arrive at massage noir, which is the hatred of black women, black women. for simply yeah. being, for black simply being. And women at the same time. Right. Um, so it took me a while to learn the difference between sexism and misogyny, you know, because sex sexism has to do with the supremacy of men, whereas misogyny has to do with the hatred of women. Um, right. These two things are not mutually exclusive, but I actually do have Diallo's working definition of misogyny to play for the people. Colonel Massage Noir. That means the hatred of black women emanating from black people. And it's black men and black women. Shaharazad Ali. Yes. Oh, did I say names? Women that's for no other that's impolite. Them being black women <laughs> is, happens, comes from other black women as well. Now, I wanted to get into this. Um, yeah, you did. You did. Like I said, you are the troll stroll ambassador. Of, no, of... no. I, I got my first threat of a lawsuit. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. of days ago. Mm -hmm. So now I have to change up things. I have to be more uh, litigious and, yes. and, 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 and more uh, um, careful in how I phrase things. Because I yes. called a man who engaged in relentless psychological and emotional abuse of his <laughs> wife and who um, made his wife feel threatened for his life, who had a long history of assaulting his wife. I called him a woman beater. Mm. And he sent me an email specifying the, the particulars of how he abused his wife over decades did not qualify as beating. So he threatened mm. to sue me for using the word beater as opposed oh, wow. to abuser or manipulator or exploiter. So, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So I got to be more careful. Got to be more careful. <laughs> got to be more careful. Well, we are going to welcome Namdi, who uh, put a comment in the chat to the chat. He says, my God, the yellow. Yes, yes, he is. He is our guy. But I really appreciate the fact that you have added intersectionality into the conversation about misogynoir, because for some odd reason, there are those who do not understand that there is a unique oppression that goes along with being both black and a woman. And so for that reason, I found this delightful and I'd like mm. to share it with you. Uh, I, I think this may be the simplified definition of misogyny that we both need to work out of for anyone who doesn't understand what we're about to talk about. Right. So here it is. I think you'll like this. I thought that perhaps I had dumbed it down to the dumbest and easiest level, but now we are going to do misogynoir for cavemen. Black have oppression. Women have oppression. Black women have oppression. Unique to black women, not simply black oppression or woman oppression, new black woman oppression. Black man have unique oppression. Black women have unique oppression, both under white oppression, white oppression like Swiss army knife, many tools. Many black men try to put away racism, but keep patriarchy. Many black women point out whole tool fucked point out patriarchy hurt black woman black man bitch about accountability black man very unwilling to part with patriarchy white woman buddy up for convenience white man stay winning black man very unwilling to say patriarchy bad black man want power low-key like white man from patriarchy big problem for black man because it don't work that way anytime black woman point this out black man get very angry black man say Guess we blame black man now. Black man still won't let go of patriarchy. Black man, black woman have other dynamics that if me no make a side for, people get pedantic. However, me point is, in game should not be patriarchy go to black man. In game should be throwing out Swiss army knife. If me hear one more comment, say take accountability, black woman. Me drop boulder on him. Me drop boulder on him. You can't call something caveman and then put in pedantic. <laughs> Come on, duty. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, for those of us, he, <laughs> listen, he's been breaking it down several different ways. Right, right, right. But I want to reference something because I have become quite a disciple of Diallo in and of myself. You know, over here on my channel, I love to say that misogyny is just racism, sexy cousin. So I like that you made a, um, you know, caveat there, which I, I want to hear a little bit more about that. But Misogyny is another byproduct of white supremacy, white male patriarchy, which mm. allows black men, as you have termed, okay, 
I told you I was going to paint you into a corner now. I've been listening uh, to Diallo. You call them the powerless right. patriarchs. But yeah. they have an ability to participate in white supremacy by way of male privilege. Right. Well, I, I don't like the term privilege. Hmm. I, I've been fighting against the word uh, male privilege, white privilege. I don't like the word privilege at all because privilege is something you give to a well-behaved child. It's not something hmm. you give to a genocidal tyrant. Um, so I call it pathology, mm. white pathology, male pathology. These are pathological processes, not privileges. So where, where does this lie when it comes to the legitimacy of power bases? Because my issue is that everything we're being told about, I mean, because there's been some violence going across this whole social media concept, and I thought you were a little light on on confronting the misogyny. It got confronted, but you promised a part two that I haven't seen yet. Most people, oh, I did. I did. A, oh, sorry, I did no, a part two. Sorry, really? It yes. was it on another channel because I must have missed yes. it. Yes, yes, it was. It was on Black Power Media. Okay, with, with, well, share with, with me. Share with me some some takeaways from that, because I really wanted to hear. I was looking around for Skip Coon, couldn't find him nowhere. Oh, well, um, I think I pointed out that that um, I kind of talked about black men mimicking white men. And we really mm -hmm. from 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 emancipation, reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights. They were kind of like the yardstick mm. for, for for black men in they terms of. Oh, I'm sorry. That was uh, me. so. I talked about that. I I think I don't know if I if if which um which discussion it was on, but I I talked about um black men deeming black women worthy. Mm -hmm. And so since black men were denied the material or or legal resources to act in the way that white men act even though that was the desire and the standard to conduct ourselves as white men breadwinners, protectors, so on and so forth. So we were giving this standard of manhood and this, this uh, definition of manhood, and then we were denied all the material and legal means to achieve that. So that created this, even during chattel slavery, that created this fracture in black men. So I'm, I'm the protector, I'm the, uh, the leader, I'm all of this. I'm not in a position to do that. So I I'm stuck in a choice. I could either confront my oppressor mm -hmm. and, and retake that position, kind of where the guy talked about black men becoming the patriarchs, or I can deem black women unworthy, mm -hmm. saying, well, I would protect, I would provide, I would, you know, uh, be the support, I would be the man that I'm supposed to be this, that this pathological capitalist patriarchy society says I'd be, but you are either too low mm -hmm. to be worthy, you know, you, you, you know, uh, immoral, too ignorant, too nasty, too loud, too rude, too masculine. Too, so you're unworthy that way. Or you're too high, you know, mm -hmm. too much, you talk too much. So it's not even something, oh, you're either a thought or you're a job stealing, uh, frigid, you know, bed winch. So mm -hmm. black men in as an ego defense mechanism within ourselves begin to construct this unattainable uh, image of what a black woman should be in order to be worthy mm -hmm. of us giving her shit that we didn't even have to give her anyway. Even if the black woman made herself, if every black woman tomorrow woke up and was magically Shahrazad Ali mm -hmm. and <laughs> was conducted herself as the submissive feminine just sexual enough to be attractive, but not sexual enough that any other man would find you attractive and all this shit, innocent, virginal. We still don't even ha have the resources or the status to even give you that. So mm -hmm. there, it, it is literally an insane, unattainable thing. And this is one of the things I call a shit eating contest because you're mm -hmm. competing for something that even if you win it, you you lose you you lose even if you win. So I I talked about that you know the black woman's worthiness and and black men being able to absolve ourselves of our role that we're supposed to play in our community by deeming our black women unworthy. Okay. She don't support us enough, or she do too much, and she's out here taking my job, or she refuses to bring a job. She wants to own the table, or she you know 
And another trick with this, this black woman is cool. I, I noticed a lot of black men that use the rhetoric about the black woman is queen. And how does a black woman prove that she's queen? By behaving like a peasant, by yeah. submitting, having no idea, <laughs> or that the black woman is God or goddess. Oh, I met uh, the black woman. So these are traps that a lot of black women fall into. Yes, sir. They fall into these traps trying to live up to this unobtainable, absurdist uh, relationship or interplay. And a lot of black men and women have bought into this and it's harming us both. It's, it's, it's rendering us incapable of having function, functional and mutually supportive relationships. relationships and yeah. it's rendering us, which is most important, incapable of organizing to dismantle and destroy white hegemony and, 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 and global capitalism, which is what we ultimately have to do for any relationships to be functional and healthy. We can't have any healthy relationships under, uh, that's why I, I, I don't know if you saw me, my, my, my presentation on black love is not revolutionary, nor should mm -hmm. we want it to be. Mm -hmm. So in order to have true love and true relationships, there's, there's this hurdle of, of all relationships are corrupted by capitalism, white hegemony, patriarchy, and theology. So these irrational delusions that that feed into the that feed the pathology is 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 um. yeah that's 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 very much the lane that I have been on. I actually have Diallo mm. on capitalism, and every time I'm listening to what our men are saying they need out of us in order to create a functional thriving system. It sounds like the Kardashians telling everybody they need to work, but I have Diallo right. on Diallo. So check this out. Let's see. Racism and capitalism are connected. Okay. Um, and the connection between racism and capitalism is uh, in this modern context. I, I like to quote um, Claude Anderson okay. back when he was saying, when he said that racism holds Black people in place while capitalism steamrolls over us. So I feel like misogyny is holding Black women in place while patriarchy is steamrolling over them. But my, my loss in the whole situation is what is the end game? If the reason why I picked the backdrop of post racial. America is because I'm increasingly hearing black men say things like I'm not a black this, you know, and this goes all the way back to the 70s when it's like I'm not black, I'm OJ. And so all of the accountability for the black community, for me, I feel like the the out for black men that I've had association with is what well, we're not black anymore. You know, we're we're not black. We're not responsible for all that black stuff and all those black problems. But then at the same time, they're holding this huge weight over the head of black women, that black women, black feminism, welfare, all of these trappings that we uh, brought into the community have been the failure of the community, like you said, right. have been yeah. the reason that they can't participate. So yeah. how can it be both? How can we eradicate blackness, but at the same time be using it to divide the community? Because misogynoir feels like crack in the 80s to me. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I think misogynoir, well, I mean, let's let's deal with the, the racial component first and, and race. Um, black people, before we can make race anything we want it to be, whether that is to eliminate racial hierarchy or to, to make or put ourselves to flip the racial hierarchy with black on the bottom and white below, or, or like you said, post-racial colorblind. Before we can do anything with race, we have to take control of the means of production and the institutions of the society. There you go. So we can have ambitions in terms of I'm no longer black or I'm no longer this, but Louis P. Newton told us power is the ability to define reality and have it act in the desired manner. So black people are in no position to dictate that race is no longer relevant or race is the most relevant thing. Now, internally as a community and a culture, we do have the ability to make race first a value and, and a goal within our community. 
But within the greater society, we do not have the power to do that, but we can organize towards that. So a lot of these black people, there is a long history of African people denying our heritage because we came, we were essentially defeated. We were invaded, colonized, uh, dispersed uh, against our will across the globe, had our identity stripped. Uh, it's basically called what Dr. Marimba Anishi calls the, the Ma'afa. And as a result of that, uh, when our humanity was legislated back into existence, we went from chattel, from human beings, to chattel, livestock, to back to human beings. And when we were redefined again, once again, as human beings from chattel, uh, our identity was that of U.S. citizens, but second class citizens. And so black identity and who we are and how we define ourselves, self-determination has been an ongoing and evolving struggle. Mm -hmm. And there's two ways that people can be unified in that struggle. That's externally, or as uh, Gil Scott Heron said, people can be unified by their love of each other, or people can be unified by barbed wire fences. Mm -hmm. So there's two types of unity. Unity that is imposed on you by your oppressor, meaning mm -hmm. that you're black, and this is what we define blackness as, criminal, thug, subhuman, and this is where we say black will live in slums, this is what we say as the ceiling for black, as high as black people can rise. This is the role you will play in our society. This is how our society will define you. And we can get to the position where we say we reject that. But it's not enough to just make the proclamation we reject it. We have to organize ourselves and put ourselves in a position of power to destroy our oppressor's capacity to do that. So until then, we are in a racist society that is a racial hierarchical society, and it harms us as Black people to engage in the fantasy of being post-racial without engaging in deconstructing the racist institutions that impose a ra unjust racial hierarchy on us. So that's the post-racial thing. And then in terms of we're post-racial, which is very strong, which I encounter even amongst scholars and, and, and activists that I organize with, this concept that black women conspired with the government to destroy the black family through welfare, black women conspire. I had a brother go online and research all of the specific grants, business grants and scholarships that were targeted at black women. And he shared, gave me my inbox full of it, you know, and was like, look at all these things that are set aside for black women. Black woman is the enemy. The black. Oh, I'm gone. What a... Do not oh. ask me what happened. Oh, OK. And so. <laughs> <laughs> and we found out today Cheever isn't better. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that is very much a, a I wouldn't even call it a trope. That is a, a delusion that many black men and some black women do have about a black woman being an asset or an agent or an ally of the white man in the downfall of black men particular, but the black race as a whole. And yeah. I've heard some very prominent black individuals from say that, you know, um, irritated genie said that black woman is a rabid dog and she's been turned into made rabid by the system. And so you can't, there's no cure or vaccine for, for rabies. So you, he yeah, said, you know, right. there's only one solution when something goes rabid. And I had another brother who says he's pan-African and fighting for, for the liberation and unification of African people. And he told, called me gynocentric as an insult. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you've been concerned about that one for, for yeah, a few, yeah. few days well, it's, now. It's a new one. Up. I thought I had an extensive vocabulary. You know, I, I, I went to school long enough to learn all the good words. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the multi-syllable words that got past me. So I just learned that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, so, we're making up our own meanings of things. But to me, that is a way of them being able to take even the defenses within the black community that black women could potentially have. It's all about isolating us. I personally believe that all forms of hate, racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, texturism, 
<laughs> I've been a victim of that one. Featureism, all the isms that you can think of have their basis in the hatred of white women. But you made a very valid point on your show that um, I wanted to bring into this element. Sorry, my whole screen changed. If you could have seen what happened, it went from black to white. I was like, oh, oh. my God, <laughs> it just blanked out on me. But one of the biggest things that you talked about was how misogyny has become dangerous, how it extends beyond the borders of blackness. Like we're watching what these black men are saying on um, social media podcasts. And yeah, that sucks, but it's actually mm -hmm. dangerous for us as black women because it is outside the borders. And I think sometimes white America gets their cues <laughs> from what they can do to us from how we esteem each other. So here is Diallo on misogyny and medicine. Misogyny is real. It is, it is not just an inconvenience for black women. It is not just a uh, unpleasantness for black women. It is literally proving to be deadly for black women. And whether we're talking about interpersonal violence, intimate partner violence and homicide, or we're talking about medical ne neglect, black women due to massage noir, due to the devaluation and hatred, abject hatred for black women, black women, um, even though they have lower rates of bre breast cancer, they tend to get later diagnoses, and the, the physicians do not want to engage with um, treatment of black women's uh, ailments, chronic ailments. They're now, I've seen this one myself. This one's a big, big, big one. Do you feel like this uh, change in how we are defenseless kind of almost within our own community is going to have a wide-ranging wide effect? I mean, what do you mean? Um, how black women are defenseless within the community amongst other black people? Yes. What I mean is the misogynoir is it's dividing us against each other, if you will. So mm -hmm. you spoke on this same podcast about how your wife will come and get you <laughs> because it's like, I need a man to speak on my behalf right. because right. these folks are going to be wild and I don't need this. So yeah. for us now as women having the the voice from within, like you said, uh, white people will look for black voices that validate the things they're saying about black people. So what, what do you feel like is the wide reaching effect, long term effect on black women as as these types of, you know, sentiments become more more mainstream? Um, I. I think that ultimately um, the, the, the ultimate outcome will, will, will be the extermination of, of African people, the extinction of African people. And I, I'm not saying that it's alarmist and I'm not saying that to be apocalyptic, but ultimately if with the, with the, the convergence of the scapegoating of black women and the um, disruption and destruction of the ecosystems like our capacity the the life sustaining capacity of the planet earth is being threatened now so the ultimate outcome if i had to go all the way to to the ultimate end if there's not some radical revolutionary fundamental changes in um how we relate one to the other and how we relate to ecosystems um itself to the to the very planet if that doesn't change, then human extinction is, is a very real possibility. And as the ecosystems start to collapse, we're already seeing that people, the most vulnerable people will go first. The people who are least valued by the system and the people who have the least amount of resources within the system will be the first to go. You know, and that's also in the emerging resource wars, uh, not is no more, you know, marching off for oil. People are going to be war, um, marching off for for potable water, drinkable water, um, mm -hmm. um, um, viable land for agriculture. We're going to be fighting over very basic resources. And also, if you look at the book series Endgame, yes. uh, conflict always is always accompanied by massive targeting of women and children through for, for abuse, um, assault, and repression. There's never been a conquest that wasn't associated with systematic rape and, and wide ranging abuses of women on both sides of the conflict, the aggressors and the aggressed, the, the, the victors 
and the and the conquered that is always accompanied by warfare so women the more societal instability we see and environmental instability we see you'll see an intensification of the exploitation of women the passage of laws to restrict women the passages of mm. policies to force reproduction on women or to turn women into incubators you know uh essentially that have no bodily autonomy so that's all convergence so the ultimate outcome is um is um extinction but as we roll towards that without organizing for for pan african liberation you're going to have increase in chronic disease shortened lifespans the women who are born and grow up will be smaller in stature with mm. with more psychological and feel uh, and physical um ailments contamination dioxin in the breast milk uh micro plastics in the brain stem more mm. isolation so higher rates of and and the issues that come with that drug addiction self harm uh suicide more institutionalization whether it is in mm -hmm. mental institution or incarceration mm -hmm. uh through either survival techniques or through failing to submit to the restrictive policies women are going to start being imprisoned for miscarriages and black mm -hmm. women have a much higher rate of miscarriages for right and now miscarriage can be associated as an illegal abortion it's already happening in many other theocratic nations that have outlawed abortion so what's going to happen chronic disease uh, uh injuries uh isolation addiction and all those other social ills that come they will be intensified more dysfunction up to we completely lose the capacity to reproduce ourselves and to to function and feed and house ourselves in, in on the planet okay you spoke about unless because, I mean, that's that's a lot of doom and gloom right there, Diallo. You know, that's just my game, okay? That makes mm -hmm. me feel like a Doc Holliday in a <laughs> tombstone. But mm. you talked about the need for revolutionary action. Mm -hmm. And the gospel, according to Diallo, what would re revolutionary action look like? Well, the first internal revolution, first thing, revolution is an intellectual endeavor. We'll have to uh, change our worldview and social theories. You know, and as we begin to think and and um, revel in a revolutionary capacity, then we can have a radical analysis. After having a radical analysis, which is basically diagnostics, you have okay. before you can cure a disease, you have to properly diagnose a disease. If you do not properly diagnose, meaning if you do not have a radical revolutionary analysis of the nature of oppression and the state of society, whatever solution you implement can harm you. Meaning that. If you have a severe stomach ache, there are a number of things that could cause your stomach from from a metastatic tumor to indigestion or gas. And you can get the best treatment. But if you get the best treatment for the wrong with the wrong diagnosis, you will exacerbate the problem. So what a lot of black people do is we have justified outrage. We know there's something wrong, but we refuse because we are about action. I'm not about all that talk. And so we, we, we reject dialogue and discourse, and we also engage in a high rate of anti-intellectualism, which is meant to say. So once we get the radical analysis, we first, we radicalize ourselves, we, we develop a radical analysis and critique, and then you start to construct an outlook, social theories, agendas. And I know this is not the sexy part because they don't make movies about this part of revolution. Every time we go see the Battle of Algiers or a documentary about the Haitian revolutions, they go straight to the machetes or they go straight to the Kalashnikovs and they go straight to the trenches. They never show the time that, that uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Che Guevara or, or Patrice Lumumba or, or, or Asada Shakur spent studying researching, dialoguing, discourse, mm -hmm. debating. So after all that, then once the mind, once you got your man right, free your mind and your ass will follow. That's when you start to engage in revolutionary organization based on radical analysis. So revolutionary organization, unification, agenda, construction, agenda, institution, harm reduction, subversion of the establishment. All of that work has to be based on your local and regional analysis and rooted in and grow out of your existing resources that run alongside the accumulation 
and recruitment, accumulation of resources and ongoing recruitment and ongoing outreach and education. Right. So once that's done and you start to define, well, I live in Chicago, which is the, the third biggest metropolis versus my brother, Skip, that's in, in the South. Uh, my, my wife who works in academia, my brothers that work in healthcare, sisters that are that that work in, in the schools. Once we revolutionize and we come up with this culture of resistance, or some call it a cult of resistance, we begin to implement these various agendas mm -hmm. that are intercoordinated uh, uh, and, 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 and um, fused together across a, a wide range of areas and issues and targeted institutions and targeted agendas. We go international with it. So okay. we begin to build up, basically, and try to go caveman. We build the world we want to live in by deconstructing the world we currently live in. We take mm -hmm. the infrastructure, we reclaim the resources, we reclaim the power, we take it, we cultivate it, and we recreate it. We subvert our oppressors and we empower our liberators who are ourselves. We empower ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it is not really in terms of, we have so many examples in history of successful and failed revolutions um, yeah. that, you know, and it's kind of hard to, because each point that I talk about unto itself could be a complete show. So we just Absolutely. basically have to become revolutionaries and then carry out revolution. And revolution cannot, a lot of people like to commodify revolution, have a revolution of your mind, revolution of your heart, and, and, and once you free yourself, revolution has no, is not personal. There's no such thing as freeing yourself. There's no such thing as uh, being a revolutionary who is not engaged in confronting the systems and institutions that plague and oppress you. You can't be revolutionary because, you know, I've got myself together. There's no there's nothing individual or personal about this. This is a mm -hmm. collective endeavor. This is a material endeavor. And that's one more thing I want to say. Our movements absolutely must be secular and rationalist. I was just getting ready to say I was just getting ready to say, because I know that you are a secular anarchist, you're all about power for all instead of the centralized uh, power movements, which I think have been detrimental in the past to us because we were following certain people instead of following a certain purpose, which right. is what I'm getting out of what you're saying. But I do feel now that this element that has crept in amongst us, this Bill O'Neill, Cohen, Cointel Pro type element that is coming along with this mis mis misogynoir it's a word i can't even say maybe i'm not meant to um and we have so many people in the chat as well that i have not even had the opportunity because we've been go go going um anti-black misandry mm, for another day for another day but namdi uh we appreciate your your comments we are definitely um you know, I'm all about revolution and what revolution is going to cost us. But I do want to bring this video in because I think the um, when you talk about the education piece, you know, the education piece has been missing for us for a long time. This is from my live stream where you and I kind of said something similar. So I'm going to show mine and I'm going to show yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Massage Noir. That means the hatred of black That's women the wrong emanates. One. Sorry. Boo -doo. I have so many clips, you know. Let's see. Videos. This one is mine. I don't even know how that started playing. Okay. That I feel like with man's issue, you know, we as women, we're going to go out, we're going to go support, but then... When it was Roe versus Wade, they just let it happen. You know, when it's when it's about women's issues, when does our issues ever come on the docket and we get the full scale of support? You know, when we talk about gender, uh, gender pay gaps, when we talk about, you know, discrimination for black women in medical care, like none of these things <laughs> become part of the black agenda. And I think that could be responsible for why so many women step are stepping back out of those political spaces, because like, what's the reward? That I feel like with so me, that one was mine, and here is yours. Okay, and I know 
I don't think misogyny, sexism is an issue for black women, that black women should be talked about. I think black men, we need to start talking about this. And dealing with the issues that confront black women specifically does not diminish or harm or detract from the issues that uh, confront black men. Dealing with issues that confront black youth. There are issues specific to black youth. There are issues that are specific to our black elders. There are issues that are specific to our black LGBTQ plus community. There are issues that are specific to black disabled people. And acknowledging some of these particular targeted communities will only strengthen, strengthen our larger struggle for justice. You cannot have a liberation or justice mm. struggle that tells Preach. any member of the community you have to be quiet about the issues that target you specifically and sacrifice yourself for the greater good. That is not a good thing. That is not positive and it doesn't work. The only viable struggles are ones that allow a space for everyone. There you go. See that right there. That's what I'm talking about. This it's is bother me how that scarf is clashing with my sweater. I gotta, I gotta well, you, do better. <laughs> you were, um, you were holding yourself together with that scarf. Uh, you said, yeah, you I didn't mean to. Yeah, I, I wasn't well. I was a little under the weather because <laughs> I just was wearing that for warmth. I didn't mean to make it part of my show. <laughs> but well, you were spitting that day, and I feel <laughs> like the only way forward, um. The only way to close ranks, I think it was Stokely Carmichael that said the only way to, um, in essence, make progress in an open market is to close ranks. And I feel like if we cannot, um, Diallo's number one fan, you got to know this person personally. They said I'm Diallo's biggest fan student. I appreciate his work. He's encouraged me to study and go vegan. And I'm going right. to let That's you. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I'm gonna let you convince me of that one right there. You've you've turned me get off on, the swine. <laughs> you've turned me on anarchy, so the, the veganism is next. But it says what I despise is seeing religious black people identifying sexism in their religions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think uh, black people love religion for, partly for that reason. But my question is, how do we? create a revolutionary state how do we as women participate in that revolution without being able to close those ranks around the fact that most of these are issues that have to be taken up for men by men with men it's just it isn't even our fight well if you want me to speak to women specifically then i'll put on my manosphere cap let me let me <laughs> tighten because you want me to deal with these females <laughs> what you do with these females? we're about to get a million we about to get a million views now. Get the people a sound bite. Right. Listen, I didn't call you the troll, troll ambassador for no reason. Okay. All right. Let's talk about these females. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In terms of black women, because I have been anti-feminist for a long time. And the reason mm -hmm. I'm anti-feminist mm -hmm. is because it doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some caveats to that because anarcho-feminist uh um communist feminists within the anarcho-communist movement or or radical feminists that's why i don't like the term turf because they it, it it's a, a trans exclusive radical feminist where mm -hmm. where uh dave Chappelle called himself a turf radical feminist uh, seek to not just destroy patriarchy, they seek to destroy capitalism and the systems and institutions of, of within hierarchy. So do anarcho-feminism, where mainstream feminism, like Hillary Clinton and, and, and Gloria Steinem or, or Condoleezza Rice, they seek equality with men. In the system. Huh? And they see within the system, mm -hmm. right? The girl boss, girl CEO, support women on businesses or women rising in the ranks of the U.S. military, and all that. And so, um, and white feminists have siphoned off so much righteous uh, rage from black women. They they have have taken the black woman's struggle and made it. And, and use it to fuel their own elevation within the system without fundamentally changing the system. And we see, I don't, uh, that, that women CEOs, women cops, women, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong, female cops, 
female CEOs, these females, they're, they demonstrated the capacity to be just as br brutal, just as uh, uh, exploitative, just as parasitic when given the opportunities within the systems and institutions of white domination and capitalism. Um, th I might, this might be a little old, but you go back to the images of Abu Ghraib and how the women fully participated in the, in the imperial uh, campaign in, in, in the Middle East and how they participated mm -hmm. and allowed themselves, their very femininity to be weaponized mm. because of the, the culture, the sexist patriarchal culture in the Middle East where they, while using everything from their menstrual blood to, to, to putting the men in compromising positions and then threatening to serve. So they allowed their femininity to be weaponized to advance the agendas of the racist genocidal, or I, genocide is too kind of word, the omnicidal system of U.S. Mm -hmm. imperialism. Mm -hmm. So women have to go further. When they're talking about Are these women doing too much, I say women are doing enough in terms of radical uh, radicalization. There's another mm. one more thing I, I keep saying women. These females, I, I, these, uh, females. They, they, these females, a lot of times black women put it on black men. This this broke boy, broke nigga uh, uh, trope where you you impose on black men, you want the black man to get all of the material benefits of capitalism and patriarchy but have none of the pathologies, not privileges, none of the pathologies. Pathology. Mm -hmm. So I am to go out into a racist, sexist, patriarchal, predatory system and accumulate fiat, mm -hmm. make a whole lot of money, and then come home and take off that same predatory mentality that allowed me to make all that money and and take it off when I take off my Brooks brother tailored suit and then be a humane partner. Mm. So you want Donald Trump in the streets and you want Patrice Lumumba in the sheets. So that, that has been something that I've seen quite a bit, even conscious and feminist women, when they start to mock black men for our lack of money, our lack of status and our lack of achievement within this system. When even White people understood when they talk about broke black men, the broke black men were the black men who failed to integrate into the system. The mm. black men who were able to integrate into the system and elevate into the system were considered broken in. Mm -hmm. And when a black man failed to get with the program, he had to be sent to special facilities to be broken. So a black man isn't broken when he lacks money. He ain't broke because he doesn't have money or car or status or he doesn't measure up to the standards set by our oppressor. A black man is broken when he embodies the standards of our oppressor. Mayweather is broke. You know, Obama is broke. Is a broke boy. And so in terms of black women becoming radical, I see a lot of times they for oh, damn it. These black females, females. There we go. be radical. <laughs> so there's a critique on both sides. We both have things we need to work on on both sides. So and you ask about these females. So I'm going to just tell you about how they do. So be more radical. Be more revolutionary. You know, be if you must be more intensified, because I don't think it goes far enough, because when black women just start to say, hey, Black women have particular issues. Oh, y'all, y'all getting out in front, or you know, uh, y'all um, are distracting from the movement, or taking away, or diminishing the, the the struggle, or causing disunity. I say lean harder into that, go harder into that, because if this shit is not broken, we see what what political political legislative policy reforms happen, but the culture. Is sustained. We look at South mm -hmm. Africa, which could be defined as the rape capital of the world if you exclude certain places in Southeast Asia, the mm -hmm. rape capital of the world. So how did freedom for black people, which wasn't true freedom, result in uh, uh, things like what is called corrective rape yeah. become commonplace? So how, how do, do, do black women forefront, Winnie Mandela, how do black women be at forefront of a liberation struggle 
secure that liberation, air quotes again, and then get kicked all the way to the back. All the way to the back of the bus. Right. Even though you were on the front lines of the struggle and you're in the back of the line when it's time to line up for the concessions and resources and status within the new system. So it's a trick. So um, it's not enough to be, oh, you know, my girls, my sister's girl power. It has to be revolution. It has to be revolutionary because if it's not revolutionary, then it is just another integrationist movement. Mm. And feminine women's integration harms women and the community as a whole because every harm reverberates. Mm. You know, a lot of times I have to talk to brothers in terms of how sexism, misogyny, and patri patriarchy harms black men. Because yeah. if I just leave it limited to what it, the effects it has on black women, mm -hmm. they're not trying to hear it. So it is in the same way. Sometimes you got to go to the sisters and talk about what the brothers go through and how what the brothers are subjected to in this system or even given putting out and encouraging men to be achievers within the systems instead of resist the system will reverberate into harm women mm -hmm. so you know it, it, the planet is a fishbowl everything hurts everybody even if the the harm starts with you it eventually i hate this term trickles down or trickles uh -oh. up or trickles laterally uh -oh. to everyone else down. okay right <laughs> but now we are finding that the trickle down and you know and that's this in essence of respecting your time you know right. we are understanding that the trickle down now has found it has found its resting place. Right. I am seeing a lot of women on the other side of this being revolutionary. You know, I'm in the finance industry and they actually rely on us being revolutionary to um, innovate their systems. It's always been. Right. That. So my biggest thing is how do we now as as women, because I had a video that I didn't put in here because it was I can I don't think I could watch it again um, where this where this man was talking about how black women are the biggest enemy that the black man has ever had, even more so now than the white man could be. So for us, it's like, OK, we are in the marketplace, like you said, assimilating and integrating because they're after being at the forefront of these movements. You know, like I said, in the post-racial world, everybody dismantled everything and went home. They were like, you know what? The fight for civil rights is over. We've got a couple million dollars. We got some white women like, hey, it's not a black thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So how now that everything has trickled down into black women? Because black women are still black. They're still black. So everything that's revolutionary, in my opinion, that's happening in the black community almost rests completely on our shoulders, whether we can bring black men back into the community, whether we can gather the assets and the resources that we need, the education piece. You know, black women are out here outpacing uh, the male counterpart. And like you said, we're being deeply integrated into this system. So how can revolution happen in the backdrop of all of of the elements of what we're being asked to take on. We got to be revolutionary and assimilated at the same time because we're not secured that same protection, access to resources, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's when you have to, that's only through revolutionary organization, um, mm. um, institutions and community organizations of mutual support, uh, material, emotional, psychological, and uh, social uh, systems of support. So the, the only way to do that within that um, system is to come up with um, culturally and intellectually affirming um, interactions and bodies. So organizations, events, culturally relevant engagement, concerts, music, dances, study groups, political groups uh, or political factions or, 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 or sub parties. That's the only way to to what I don't call because we're not really it, navigate the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you're in a turbulent ocean and if the boat doesn't sink, the boat has to adapt. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dick Gregory always said one thing that black women had exemplified in this system, but we never call them is responsible. Black women's adaptability and African adaptability in general 
is what allowed us to endure conditions that um, caused other populations to go extinct. Very Dr. John Henry Clark uh, highlighted that, and he wanted Black people to understand it is not because we are physical stature, because we are physically stronger or larger, that, that we were able to endure conditions that drove other populations to extinction. He said, because of our adaptability of our culture. So our culture was never a rigid culture. Oh, and another thing he said is when you look at the best thing about a people on the other side of it, you'll find the, the worst thing about the people. Yep. And one of the good things he said that was really good about black people is our ability to embrace and understand other people. And it's what is called xenophilia. We had no fear of the stranger. We had no fear of, of, of the new thing where other cultures can tend to be xenophobic. But mm -hmm. on the other end of that, that made us very vulnerable for infiltration. Yes. You know, we are very quick to ad adapt to other religions. Half of the African continent is Muslim and half of the African <laughs> continent it's is Christian. Christian. And Ooh. Muslims and Christians have shown nothing but utter contempt for African people and African culture and the African identity and the African mentality. These are alien colonizer oppressor religions. And every time I'm in the community trying to organize, I get a barrage of from Jesus from one side and Muhammad from the other. And do. And if you are a Palestinian organizing against Zionist genocide, one fight you ain't got to have. <laughs> There's one fight you don't have to have. It might be a lot of tactics, whether approach the world community or, or take it to the streets and, and, and guerrilla warfare. There's one fight you don't have to have. You know, if you're in Ireland, there's one fight you don't have to have. If you're fighting against British colonials, they might even have to fight Protestant and Catholic. But there's no non-African people arguing about, are we Igbo? Are we Yoruba? Are we Akan? Are we Egyptian? Ain't nobody fighting over African, no non-African people bumping heads within their race, within their culture, about African God, African folklore, African mythology, African very concept of reality and existence while we are fighting each other and hacking each other to bits literally and figuratively over alien concepts of the divine yeah so that is a big problem and people are like why if you don't believe in god why are you always talking about it? you know so anyway i get i'm sorry i can't mention i go into my <laughs> you know the devangelical spirit possesses me <laughs> Yes, well, you know, that's another so one of our, 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 that, yeah. our opposing so, views. Right, but. so, but let me get back to, so the way you navigate that is you have to construct community around yourself. There you know, when my wife was getting her doctorate, she said she'd all, and she went back and referred her notes when she was publishing her dissertation. And she was always writing in the notes, don't allow yourself to be educated out of your mind. Don't educate yourself out of your mind. So when you're clear on your mission, you're clear on your goals, you're clear on your objectives, and you are clear on your ideology, I say ideology is all, then you can find yourself in hostile or friendly places and remain on your square and be clear on your mission. Even if you have to adapt your techniques, adapt your tactics, adapt your methodology, rearrange your groupings, rearrange your position, rearrange or, or, or limit your resources or, or re reprioritize resources, no matter what you do, if you're clear on your mission and you're clear on your ideology, you can do it. If you wake up one morning and you see some grand black achievement, some black person achieving some great thing to bring you pride, and you wake up the next morning and you see some atrocity committed against a black youth being murdered by a racist and not even being interrogated, let alone a no matter what you encounter, you build up your community around you and you lock in your ideology. And when I say lock in your ideology, that does not mean you don't, not in a con, because me, I constantly dissect and reconstruct my ideology. Me too. My ultimate mission doesn't change, but I have to constantly refine. I am a revolutionary pan Africanist. I seek to liberate African people. I seek to destroy white hegemony. I seek to deconstruct capitalism and I seek to restore the earth's ecosystem. And depending on what age I am, who I'm with, you know, whatever status I have, whatever resources available to me, I'm very clear on that. And that mission 
and my ideology and the community I've constructed around myself, and I'm constantly evolving to and adapting that to, allows me to navigate and know that I'm doing uh, um, what's right. That's fair. And I think that's a great note across the board, because like you said, I am doing my best to keep the girls together, to, to have one band, one sound over here on the wireless woman. And huh. a big part of that is us not uh, changing the beat of that drum, uh, changing what our goals are uh, hmm. based on what we're encountering. Like you said, this is some trying, challenging times, but we adapt we persevere, we overcome. Diallo, bro, Diallo. Mm -hmm. Yes. I hope this is the beginning of something because I really want to get into your, your secular state. I myself am a black nationalist. I'm a revolutionary black nationalist Christian. It's tough still being uh, a Christian and having a revolutionary mind. But I feel right. my personal goal is to expand blackness as a power struggle. I've learned a lot from watching the um, Huns the Huns in Asia, I actually have Asian descent, you know, that whole Afro-Asianic thing. And the Huns were a group of people that were constantly adding to their knowledge and understanding of the world and creating a state that engulfed everyone's ability to participate in it. Of course, they were barbarians, you know, but I think that we as black people can be the pinnacle, like you said, of education, of culture, of refinement, if we find this way to, um, as you said, create that secular state where the LGBTQIA plus community, you know, religious and non-religious people can come into the space, you know, where men and women have equal footing and being able to create a more perfect union, like you said, as we continue to define and refine our belief systems, you know, like I've had to expand my understanding of Christianity to keep it. I've had to expand my understanding of womanhood in order to take it into spaces where it's not welcome. And I think that the blackness, you know, when you speak of Pan-Africanism, um, it has the ability to encompass the world and not to consume it. So please, if you will, give us some parting words, Diallo, and tell the people all about what you're working on and where they can find you. Well, I'm at Diallo Kenyatta across the socials. I organize here in Chicago. I'm actually uh, um, redeveloping um, the African World Coalition. You can find us online. Um, we, we are setting up projects and formations. I just recently had basically like an orientation for the African World Coalition, which is grassroots. I spent many years working on uh, grassroots projects and revolutionary grassroots and formations. Um, here, New York, Chicago, and just as the pandemic hit, I kind of had to put that some of that on hold, where I'm reinvigorating and and, and, and reemerging to to do grassroots. And um, I took a break for a couple of years to engage in advocacy, because mm -hmm. um, menticide and delusions, you know, infect not just the black people, but the conscious black community has has been plagued by a lot of delusions and backwardsness yeah. and reactionaries parading as revolutionaries. So yeah. I was very fortunate with, with the Bro Diallo show is specifically to, to reassert uh, rational discourse, to reassert uh, the, the true revolutionary academic evidence and facts-based uh, analysis of the black condition and to articulate our, our position, articulate um, the harms that are happening and um, trying to motivate African people to engage in true revolutionary struggle as opposed to reactionary uh, or, or what I call political tantrums. You yeah. know, there's a lot of black people that understand that we're oppressed. But as Dale Jones said, you know, we look we lose so much. We don't know what victory looked like. So we're trying to implement victories or implement solutions that will worsen our condition. Uh, that can be found uh, throughout the ADOS and foundational black American struggle who have co-opted and corrupted the very concept of liberation. We can find it in um, just, I mean, just naming names. There's been a lot of, and even I uh, at, at times contributed to, to this dysfunction 
and maladaptations within the black conscious community and the black liberation struggle. So I think that that's why I started to, to put out more media, begin writing more in order to challenge that on an intellectual level, because I always say that revolution is an intellectual endeavor it because is. it is. It and is. so I wanted to begin to play a bigger role in that component of, of the struggle as well. So anyway, yeah. you can find me at Diallo Kenyatta across the socials. Send me a <laughs> message. I, I, you know. And you know, I'm always sharing you over on TikTok because you don't I have that. you no, don't I, have a TikTok. Well, you have all these grades. I'm an old man, you know. <laughs> well, listen, listen. If I have I, anything to do with it, they will know your name. Um, appreciate it. So, I do appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. I know it's an education for people who are um, students of my content. I try to meet everyone where they are, you know, and it's a work that has to be done. It has to be continued. And I got called out, as I always do, for being the walking contradiction that I've always claimed to be. But he said that how are you an anti-sexism and a Christian? Listen, Diallo's number one fan. I hope that you will come back around so that I could show you how. Um, my biggest thing is we have to be all things to all men so that in some ways we may gain some. Um, there are factions of the diaspora that are strewn all around in these areas and you would be surprised when you treat the bible like folklore the ability that you have to deconstruct belief systems that people have because you'd be surprised it's a very versatile book but i say that to say that there's room in the struggle for liberation for all of us wherever we're coming from to meet each other and to meet the challenges of being, like you said, a unified multilateral state. I think people think that unification means that we are all marching to the beat of the same drum, but it doesn't. It means that we're a symphony. And, and like you said, we all have a certain part to play in creating uh, a, a, a black African state, you know, as a black American, because my whole thing is a little bit different and you've not been privy to it, but you know, I'm, I'm actually very, very deeply steeped in some things that I don't feel like stop me from being part of being revolutionary and searching for liberation with those who are like minded enough for us to put those things aside and continue, which is what you said. So we have I have your um, bio down in the description box that does talk about a lot of the movements that you've been a part of. I want you to update me on what you have going on so that I can put it in here and everyone can connect with you. I want people to know that I rocks with Diallo. We don't agree on everything, but I definitely think that you are on the right track as far as being adaptable with what we have now to work with and continuing to move forward with revolution, not just for our people, because I don't think everyone understands that black revolution has within it the liberation of all vulnerable, marginalized people. So continue to do the work. I will be there to support you. Thank you for your time tonight. And thank you for all who tuned in. Hopefully we can be back here eventually talking about that new Chicago mayor. Hmm. Anytime. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching them. Yeah, time to put feet to the fire. Yeah, I did vote for Brandon Johnson. So, so let's Very see what rampant. happens. Because I heard the police didn't stop working up there and everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they 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 doing their tactics. We'll see. Yeah. He's not a dummy, so we'll see. Well, next bet time, next bet station. Uh, you have a wonderful night, Diallo. Thank you for coming right. on. Thank you so and much. I'll see you on All the right. flip side. Next time, sis. Bye bye. Listen, we had Diallo in the building. I myself am not nearly as revolutionary as he is, but as he said, creating community is about getting these new views, this new information. I think the most revolutionary thing about what I'm trying to create over here in my content and on my channel is the ability to change, is the ability to take in new information And to be creating something, as he said, that's flexible because certain parts of what we believe (laughs) about the world as black people is no longer serving us. And we all have to begin to reevaluate community, what it means to us and what extent we're willing to go to in order to revolutionize our own thought patterns or else we will, as he always says, remain reactionary. Something will happen. We'll respond out of the reservoir of who we are and what we have available at the time. 
instead of using this time now where there isn't all this action going on, like he said, to begin to create an education around these terms. Most of the time when I talk to people about being revolutionary in our thought patterns, they don't even understand some of the terms. They don't understand the difference between capitalism, socialism, communism, and school of thoughts, the difference between patriarchy, matriarchy, and anarchy. This is the Diallo was the first person to make the secular state make sense to me because I come from a religious background and I don't care what anyone says. I'm not going to crap on people who are in those thought patterns because they are also our brothers and sisters in bondage and in chains. You know, having come out of that space, I was raised Jehovah's Witness, you guys, <laughs> having come out of that space where the socialization around religion is so deep to try to cut a person from that belief system without anywhere for them to go is a recipe for insanity. It's a recipe for those people to walk completely away from the movement. It's like when you get a brand new goldfish. You got to put them down in the bowl and let them assimilate. A lot of Black people haven't been raised in Black communities, haven't been raised with Black unity. They haven't even seen Black people working together the way that we do. It was me looking back into our history, seeing that there were all these different schools of Black thought. You had Black nationalist, you had Pan-Africanist, and you had integrationist, and all these people were sitting down together trying to engineer solutions to help Black people move forward. The problem is we got behind celebrities, we got behind certain people who were leading the movements and never came back to a place of what the point was in the first place. For so, so for those people who stop was, you know, economic progress, they got off the bus. For those people who stopped was white women, <laughs> they got off the bus. For those people who stopped was, you know, uh, being integrated into the system, they got off the bus. So now we as black people got to all get back, file back on that bus and understand that we're all coming out of different schools of thought. We're all coming out of an oppression that we no longer even understand. We no longer even understand how complex the system, as Diallo would say, of white hegemony is. But that's what we're here to do is the work of finding out not just what it is, but what our part is in dismantling it. How do we liberate the largest group of people? Black, white, foreign, domestic, doesn't matter. So I appreciate you for being here with me and bro Diallo during this time. You are Diallo's number one fan. I got to probably be Diallo's number two. So I hope to continue to see him doing revolutionary work and be a part of it to whatever extent I can be. It seemed like all the revolutionary blacks are in the big cities. And here I am down in the Bohunk backwards country. Like I said, I'm trying to meet the black people where I am. And baby, down here in this religious Bible Belt South. Trust me, I'm more savvy than you think I am. <laughs> now the I am all American um, and a lot of it has to do with um, things that I talk about on this channel I have um, I can actually draw my my white lineage um, I think that's something that makes black Americans inherently different than Africans we can um, you know we can align ourselves with African schools of thought I have no problem with that but for some of us who actually have legal claim to America, it's very difficult to wrap your mind around leaving. The Pan-Africanist Pan movements in the past have been very uh, geared towards getting Black people back into African, African culture and all these different things. I think Black American culture is something different, just like you know, Islam and Christianity and these different religions, they're different than being, you know, atheistic and having these different views. But the blackness is something that's so multifaceted. It's something that's so beautiful. It's something worth fighting for and worth aligning ourselves with. Because I, I had someone say this on my channel. I'm, I'm, I'm getting off y'all. But I wanted to share this. I had someone say this on my channel. They say, you know, no, let everybody help themselves. Because I was talking about displaced uh, Native Americans in this country. Those people for a long time were black. Mexicans, black. Dogs, black. 
anything that white people didn't consider to be equal with themselves, Italians, black, everything at a certain point in time was black. And because of so many people being willing, as we saw with Fred Hampton, with the Black Panthers, with the Rainbow Coalition, they got derailed by people. But as we've seen with so many people who were willing to align themselves with blackness, that's really where civil rights came from. Civil rights were bigger than just black people. And a lot of people, women, immigrants, got rights through the plight of black American struggle. And this is not to isolate myself from anyone else, but to tell the story of black nationalism and what it is. You know, Malcolm X was a black nationalist, whereas you have um, Marcus Garvey, who was a pan-Africanist. But these people work together for black and African diaspora um, uh, liberation, you know, because the blackness, like I said, um, it is big enough for us all to get inside of it, for us all to find purpose and meaning and reasons to uh, resist white hegemony. Because like I said, this person was saying, well, let everybody else figure that out. But even white people, <laughs> white supremacy holds on the power by inducting new groups of people into that machine to continue to draw power from. So you have um, Italians that became white, you had Irish people that became white. You had Jewish people that became white. You had Hispanics that became white. You've had men, men who have become white. And it feeds into the white power structure when people can receive privilege, as Diallo said, the word he doesn't use, but when people can receive privilege from aligning with the white power structure, that's what they will do. And I think that when we as black people are able to put forward the type of machine that will provide um, liberation from oppression 